Um, I'm Dr. John Gaber. I'm the department chair of city planning and real estate development. Um, on behalf of Clemson University, the College of Architecture, Art, and Humanities, and the Department of City Planning and Real Estate Development, welcome to the 2019 Charles E. Frazier Lecture Series, sponsored by the Masters of Real Estate Development Program. Um, before we get started, I want to make a little bit of a recognition. I want to first recognize um, um, folks in attendance from the Advancement Board, from the Real Estate Development Advancement Board. Can you raise your hand? Thank you. I also want to recognize our MRED alumni, Faculty, staff, homeboy Terry in the back, <laughs> and all our friends tonight. Tonight we're here to honor a legacy of the Charles Fraser who dramatically affected the economic stability, viability of the state of South Carolina. His vision helped transform Hilton Head Island from a sparsely populated sea island into a world-class resort. Clemson University established a Fraser Endowment for Community Design and Human Ecology in 1992, funded by the friends and associates of Mr. Fraser. We are proud at Clemson to sponsor this lecture series, which attracts former associates and the family of Mr. Fraser to provide insights into the legacy and how their professional careers have evolved as leaders of today's real estate industry. Tonight, Mr. David Rawl will introduce tonight's guest speaker, Mr. Frank Brumley, who early in his career worked with Charles Fraser and went on to become a visionary and icon in the real estate development profession. Mr. Rawl was the 2015 Fraser honoree and keynote speaker. He is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Business School. David is a retired founder of uh, Raw and Murdy, a marketing communication firm based in Charleston. He has a diverse and well-known list of clients ranging from Keel Island, Daniel Island, Wild Dunes, Orient Express, and MTV. He is also well-known for his advising services with political candidates and office holders such as Charleston Mayor Joe Riley. Furthermore, David worked closely with Charles Frazier and Frank Brumley on the advertising and branding of their developments. Again, welcome, and we're pleased you're here to honor Mr. Brumley and the legacy of Charles Frazier. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Ooh, big. I hope you can hear me. Um, it's an honor to introduce Frank Brumley. And it's wonderful to see so many members of his family here. I've got to say it was an honor also to give the Charles Fraser lecture a few years ago because it gave me an opportunity to think back of all the ways that Charles influenced my life and why Charles Fraser matters today. And for the students who are here, if all you ever did was study the life of Charles Fraser, <laughs> you'd learn more than enough to have a good business career and, more importantly, a good life. I met Charles in, I think, 1965. I was living in New York, and a business school classmate of mine, John Trask, asked me to come down to Beaufort to visit for just a weekend. But on Sunday of that weekend, he said, let's go to Hilton Head and go on a sailboat with this man named Charles Fraser. So we went over there and we got on the sailboat. And right away I could see this was a man with great interests and amazing curiosity. There were stacks of magazines all through the boat on subjects ranging from science to sunbathing. We were in the middle of the water, just land all around us, no, no building, no, no building of any sort. And at some point he just points his fingers and he says, finger and says, over there I'm going to build a Mediterranean village and a lighthouse. Well, I thought, this guy's nuts. I've got to get off of this boat. <laughs> well, of course, he built the village, he built the lighthouse, and he built a lot more. And Charles loved sailing. So, of course, he understood and he valued what it takes to be a good sailor. 
a good sea captain. You gotta have a good crew. You gotta have a good plan of what you're gonna do. And there's another skill set that is really vitally important because there are always surprises, unexpected challenges like the weather can go crazy, your crew person, your member can get sick, or you hit something and you start taking on water. And the ability of a captain to navigate through those unexpected changes and challenges can significantly affect the success with which they reach their final destination or whether they reach it at all. And those are precisely the business skills that Charles Fraser found in Frank Brumley 50 years ago when he pulled him out of the banking business. Because Frank Brumley has this amazing ability to get things done, to find a way to get something done. He sees an obstacle as a challenge. He meets it coolly, rationally, with reason, and with empathy. Frank respectfully listens to people. He really hears them. We used to call that people skills, but now it's known as part of something called social and emotional intelligence, more valued than ever, and rightfully so. Frank's got it. And as a result, Frank can always find a fair, mutually agreeable solution. And because he's such a professional and such a gentleman, he makes it look easy as though it was there all the time. Really maddening. <laughs> Frank grew up in Georgia, went to the University of Georgia, banking school there. His first project with Simon, with Charles, was something at Cumberland Island. He so impressed Charles, Charles put him in charge of the Mealy Island in Florida. His success there led him to the leadership of Kiowa Island, in the early 70s after the Kuwait Investment Company had bought the island, planned to develop it. That's where I met Frank. And that's where I saw firsthand and appreciated and so valued his sea captain skills because Kiowa was a real challenge. I mean, I think that other than the, the Kuwaitis and those of us who worked on Kiowa, pretty much everybody was against it, both locally and nationally. Environmentalists were against the development, conservationists, preservationists, Jewish groups and others drawing attention to the boycott of Arab oil, residents of the neighbor island, John's Island, who didn't want their property taxes to go up. They didn't want more traffic. That certain segment of Charleston that's against everything, they were against it too. <laughs> my role with my company was to reverse that negativity and create broad-based public support for the development, help get the permits necessary and branding of the island so that it would be successful selling its real estate locally, regionally, and nationally. Very complex challenge and lots of different constituencies. And the best part of it was the opportunity to work with Frank. And he had so much on his plate, but he always found time to help me with my area of responsibility. It was crazy. It was a very chaotic challenge. But through it all, with Frank, there was no drama, no hysterics. He was always pragmatic, always professional. He'd learn what he needed to communicate to somebody. He'd learn about them. So what they would see was an informed, empathetic professional. And that would lead to opening the door to a meeting of the minds. So the launch of Kiowa was really challenging. It required that deft navigation that you find with a great captain. And we were so fortunate to have as our leader a man who could just always find a way to get something done. And that's, you know, the ultimate sea captain. That's always been Frank's style. That was it at Amelia, at Kiowa, Wild Dunes, Daniel Island, and a whole host of smaller but very successful real estate developments. It's also been his style and that, that has attracted him to leadership positions in nonprofits throughout this community, in education, the arts, conservation, preservation. 
Frank has served those organizations with distinction and humility. One of the many things I like about Frank is he does not draw attention to himself. But if you need him, he's there. Well, you know, every great captain has a great first mate, and Frank has Blanche. Blanche symbolizes what I am pretty confident is the greatest love of Frank's life, his family, and his children, his grandchildren, children and grandchildren of his brother who, with 11 members of his family, was tragically killed in an airplane accident several years ago. There's a bunkhouse out at the Bumley Place on Wadmalaw that accommodates all the kids. And Papa, Frank, can be seen out there atop his favorite tractor frequently. Family is at the center of Frank Bumley's life. And to me, that says a lot about him. All of it good. So you're about to hear from a man who's a very good man. Man of great accomplishments, great abilities. Man who came to this community as an outsider, put his heart and soul into this community, and by every objective measure has made it a much better place. Charles Fraser's captain of choice, my good friend, Frank Brumley. Thank you, David. That concludes the program for this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said, probably. <laughs> but uh, a few interesting stories and uh, pictures and a little background of our, my particular association with Charles began, as David said, with, with Cumberland Island. I grew up in a little town, St. Mary's, Georgia, behind Cumberland, of those of you who have been there. I've been over to Cumberland, and uh, Charles Fraser walked into the bank where I was one day and said, uh, I've just bought 3,000 acres on Cumberland Island, and uh, I need some help with it. Are you interested? And I said, well, you know, I have a family business here, um, bank and a uh, oil distributorship, and uh, Blanche and I had moved there after graduating from Georgia and had our three daughters there. We were happy there. I said, you know, I really, really don't think uh, I am, but thanks very much, let's talk about it. So Charles is a very persuasive individual. So he said, uh, well, how about let's just uh, maybe do some consulting with me and uh, come and, uh, and join me a day or two a month and we'll try to figure things out. So we began that process and uh, he would fly me from St. Mary's, had a little World War II Navy training field where they could land a small plane. I'd fly up to Hilton Head, spend several days or a couple of days at a time with Charles and the staff and this was in 1969 and um, it was an exciting time and Charles was hiring uh, some of the best and brightest people from around the country. Um, Charles and I were both in little towns in South Georgia and had public education backgrounds. All these guys had MBAs and uh, from Harvard and Wharton and uh, but he was hiring really a great bunch of people. Blanche and I took the bait, fell in love with them, uh, joined the Sea Pines Company, and um, started on the work on, on Cumberland. Well, it was not to be. Cumberland was, uh, is the most beautiful property. Those of you who have not been down there, it's worth the trip. Perfectly gorgeous, 25 miles long, um, um, should never have been developed. I'm glad it wasn't. Um, after we'd owned it for about a year, and Blanche and I lived over there with our girls for a summer and I went back and forth every day that I wasn't up at Hilton Head. Charles made a decision to sell the property to the National Park Service. So I spent the next three months in Washington with a young attorney from Augusta selling the property to the National Park Service. Got back, told Charles we were successful. He said, well, do you realize you've sold your job? And I said, well, I've been, I've been thinking about that you know, <laughs> a, a bit. And, uh, but I said, I think, um, uh, you know, I think I know what we ought to do. There's a great piece of property over below Fernandina Beach, Florida, called Amelia Island Plantation. Six miles of beachfront, 3,000 acres, owned by Union Carbide. Uh, I think it's probably available. Charles said, I know the property, great idea, go see if you can buy it. 
so we took the money from uh, the sale of, uh, of Cumberland and uh, bought uh, Amelia Island Plantation uh, in uh, 1970. And uh, Blanche and I moved there with our three little girls, built the first house. And I've got some, some slides. Uh, I've been talking rather than thinking about my slides. I'll skip through the Cumberland Island chapter first. This is the the uh, ruins of uh, the main mansion great, uh, on, uh, yeah, on uh, the far end of, uh, of the island. Wonderful, oops, horses on the island, just perfectly beautiful piece of property. Uh, and it shouldn't have been developed, and I'm glad it wasn't. Um, so I've got this kind of divided into chapters. Uh, so I'm, I'm not used to using a PowerPoint. That's why I launched into the conversation. Uh, I'm the old school that uh, does it with telling stories, typically rather than, uh, than slides. But uh, um, a beautiful uh, piece of property, uh, on Amelia, gorgeous uh, beach. Um, it's a picture of Charles and myself and a young fellow named Curtis Lasser when we purchased the property. This was the 1970 edition of the Fernandina Beach newspaper. And um, so we got development underway. Charles was a wonderful role model for me, 11 years older than me. And uh, Charles was born in uh, 1929. I was born in 1940. We both had this similar South Georgia background uh, and uh, had a natural kind of affinity for small towns and family, and it, uh, and it worked uh, extremely well. Um, beautiful piece of property, a uh, little town of uh, uh, Fernandina Beach on the north end. Union Carbide, believe it or not, was going to uh, mine the property for heavy earth minerals, and uh, that's why they had bought it. And they did the same thing down at Ponte Vedra and Jacksonville Beach, those of you who know that area. It, it, they decided they were going to get a terrible black eye uh, environmentally, so they um, sold it to us, and we negotiated a 18 months free interest. They gave us a money, purchase money mortgage. Uh, Ray and Air and Container Paper Corporations were on the north end. This sounds so far into anybody today, it would be impossible. But the way that paper mills got rid of their chemical waste, which is called liquor, black and, black and green liquor, they pumped it offshore in the ocean in a wooden stave pipeline. And if you fly over that area, you'd see this tremendous big black plume of chemical out in the middle of the ocean, something you obviously could not do today. Well, the problem was that that material was also a, a lignin, and it produced like a detergent. And when the, they'd have a break closer into shore, get a lot of wave action, you'd have four feet of foam on the beach, which was a brown foam, unattractive. It's kind of hard for a real estate developer to explain, uh, you know, what, what was going on. So we negotiated a deal with Union Carbide that they would put the environmental fresh pressure on Rainier and Container, and uh, we'd have an interest-free loan until they solved the problem. So we had the first 18 months of the deal, basically while we were getting it planned and entitled, where we didn't have any cash outlay. So it was one of those things that uh, they worked out worked out very well for us. This is a, a master plan of the, of the island. Um, Blanche and I built the first house. I can find the laser pointer, which I obviously, there it is. We built the first house right here um, on the island um, in 1970. Uh, our closest neighbor was five miles away, uh, a wonderful African-American named Thomas Jefferson. And he continued to work for the company for a long number of years until he retired. But we built uh, a Pete Dye golf course here on the front, 27 holes. Then a Fazio course was added later. Built a small oceanfront uh, inn uh, here on the uh, on the center center of the island. And uh, so it was a, a small hotel here, 27 holes, Dye course here, Fazio course down here. But a beautiful piece of property and. Uh, um, Charles called one day and said, um, Frank and Blanche, uh, I've just uh, signed a contract with the Kuwait Investment Company to manage the development of, uh, of uh, Kiowa Island. And uh, it's going to have to be um, um, rezoned. It's going to have to be master planned. Uh, the kind of things you've been doing at Amelia for the last four years. Are you interested in moving to, to Charleston? 
So I went home, talked to Blanche, and it was one of those questions like, uh, please don't throw me in the briar patch. Uh, we <laughs> we had, been, had visited up here. We, we loved it. Uh, uh, we had a situation that made good sense for us to move. So we did. So we came here in 1974. There was uh, nothing on Kiowa, an old wooden bridge uh, that led to a dozen houses that C.C. C. Royal had started out there. He bought the property in 1952 for $125,000, uh, cut timber off of it, uh, sold a few houses to friends from Aiken and Augusta, and then uh, died, and his widow and five children threw some inner turmoil in the family decided to sell it. And the Kuwait Investment Company bought it in 1974 and paid $17 million for it and, um, and signed this management contract with Charles Frazier. And I was responsible for building a team and moving to Charleston and getting David involved and uh, began to build a, a marketing story for how it would be uh, developed. So it's, uh, while I've got this slide here, I'm just going to make a comment because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's newsworthy as, as we speak. There's uh, right here, this is Captain Sam's Inlet that you see in the paper about whether or not this piece of property ought to be developed. Um, and I think a lot of the current owners, Kiowa Development uh, uh, Partners, who own it now, and they bought it in the anticipation uh, from the Darby family that this could be developed and they're pursuing their legal rights. But I will tell you, this is um, a recurve spit on the south end and uh, you have this littoral drift of sand that comes from the mouth of the uh, inlet into Charleston interrupted by the jetties and you get all this tremendous buildup of uh, uh, accretion of land in the middle of the island but the two ends of the island, both ends, are extremely dynamic. And um, it was never in our financial model originally to develop or sell that property. Um, I personally think it would not be a good idea. Um, this area right here is going to breach again. It's breached twice in the 45 years that we've been here in Charleston. Um, the old adage about the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away uh, is very true. Th this piece of property will be severed, in my opinion, from the main body of, uh, of Kiowa uh, sometime in the next 10 or 15 years and needs to be approached very cautiously. Um, but a, a um, great piece of property, great master plan. Um, uh, I spent the first um, four years of my career here in Charleston uh, there on, on Kiowa and uh, loved every minute of it, got to know the island well. Blanche and I had a house out there. We, uh, Island is, is, is matured well. The master plan was uh, been implemented as, as designed. Uh, this was, we opened the hotel. This is in 1976. And that's uh, Fritz Hollings and Joe Riley had just been elected, thanks to David's help. In uh, 1975, so we opened the hotel. That's Jimmy Stuckey, who was chairman of county council, there in the middle. And I don't know who this young guy is here on the <laughs> on the right. I, I don't recognize him. I, I'll, I'll tell you that it's been long enough ago. And to this day, my our daughters, three girls, are jealous of Jimmy Stuckey's daughter, who got to clip the ribbon, and they could never understand how that happened. And I was a general manager, and uh, and but Jimmy's a good friend, as is his daughter Elizabeth, and. Uh, I'm not sure how it turned out other than I thought it was important for the chairman of county council to cut the ribbon and his daughter. So it, uh, it worked out well. But as you know, Fritz died recently. And, uh, but he was a great supporter out there. And Joe Riley has been a, a friend of mine for, uh, you know, literally for the last 45 years. And I uh, think so highly of him to me, he is to me. Charleston wouldn't be what it is uh, without Joe Riley. That's been particularly true of... Uh, of uh, the island, uh, uh, Daniel Island, and for all of Charleston. This is just an old photograph that we came up with with Jack Nicholas. We uh, had a funny story with uh, Charles about, about the prior golf course. Uh, the first golf course we built was um, uh, done by Gary Player. And uh, Charles would come up. I'm not a golfer. Uh, I built eight golf courses and don't play golf, which is kind of strange. But um, we... Um, Charles came up one day and he had decided Charles was definitely not a golfer, not an athlete. And he said, Frank, I think we ought to build an executive golf course on Kiowa. 
uh, par 64. We built this in. We had a small meeting space. And he said, it'll be a lot easier. Guys can come in here and play a three-hour round of golf. Then they can come to a meeting. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make all this work. It's really a good idea. Of course, hell, I didn't know any better. I said, sounds good to me, Charles. Uh, let's do it. So we got the course under construction. Uh, Gary Player was one of those, uh, I mean, he was a golf course designer. He was getting his fee. He didn't care if it was 24 holes. You know, he didn't care. He, you know, he was ready to build what we wanted him to build. So we had it well under construction. And some of our Sea Pines people, including Hal Ravenel, who worked with us at the time uh, from Charleston, uh, came to me and Charles and said, you guys are nuts. He said, I've talked to every golfer everywhere. Nobody wants to play an executive par 64 golf course. How are you going to explain to somebody you shot a 72? You know, and th he said, you know, it's just nuts. Don't do this. So we listened, fortunately, and said, thank you very much. We won't. And, uh, but we had to change it. We had to lengthen the course from 4,600 yards to 7,000 yards to, to get a par 72 course out of it. And to this day, and it's, been, it's called Cougar Point, it's been redone since, and they straightened out these problems. But for a long time, I would have people come up to me and say, boy, I played the player course the other day, and it really is strange. You said, you know, the landing areas and the lagoons, things are all in the wrong spot. And I'd say, well, I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm sorry you didn't like the course, and, uh, and, and moving right along. But we, we used uh, Nicholas uh, for the second course, and uh, I was part of, Blanche and I were Arnie's Army when growing up and going to the Masters, and so we had a competition, and it was Nicholas and uh, Palmer, and a fellow unknown at that time named Reese Jones came up to us to make presentations on who ought to, who ought to build the, um, the golf course. Uh, I was fully prepared to, to pick Arnold Palmer, thought he was the best. Well, he must have had a bad night the night before because he had a horrible presentation, was really off of his, uh, off of his game. And Nicholas, who I was not prepared to like as the golden bear and was kind of flashy at the time, just wowed everybody. He was just knocked us dead. He was really great, really a great salesman. So we ended up selecting uh, Nicholas and uh, Reese Jones. I didn't even remember his name. And uh, we used him to build our second golf course at, at Daniel Island. And uh, of course, he's become so famous now for great golf courses everywhere. And uh, he came up to me one day when we were starting the course at uh, Daniel Island and said, Frank, he said, you probably don't even remember. I was one of the competitors at, uh, for the second course at, uh, at Kiowa. And he said, uh, I drove down from New Jersey and I was so poor I had to stop and stay with my mother in North Carolina. And he said, I, don't, I got the feeling that I never really was in competition. I said, Reese, I didn't even remember that you were. <laughs> and, uh, and we have a good long laugh out about it. And he was a, he's a great guy and, of course, a wonderful golf course designer. But uh, this is in 1989. Um, and uh, Charles had invited Pat McKinney, my partner, and me to come down and speak. We were part of the Waylong Derby group who had bought uh, Kiowa from the Kuwaitis in uh, 1988. And Charles... Uh, uh, had a speaker series back then and invited us to come down and give it uh, give it a pitch. So this is kind of the Kiowa part two. Um, when I left Kiowa in 1978, I got a call from the Finch family, who along with Wilbur Smith and Charlie Way and Charlie Darby were developing uh, um, the Isle of Palms. And at that time, it was known as the Isle of Palms Beach and Racquet Club. It was not Wild Ends. We, we named it that uh, later in, in, a, in a marketing effort. Probably David had some help in, uh, in pick, picking that name. But uh, so I spent the time there at, uh, at Wild Ends and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Spent the part of that next 10 years from 78 to 88 you doing uh, commercial projects and building some residential at the beaches. And, uh, but everybody who would come to Charleston, the Kuwaitis had grown... Um, restless with the ownership, um, and people generally knew that it was probably for sale. I'll tell you, as much as I admired many of them, they were very difficult people to, to work for. And there's an interesting story, short story, because those of you who are young businessmen in, in training can appreciate this, but uh, 
Charles and I went to Kuwait uh, the first time, and uh, and um, together the two of us in uh, 1974 after he'd signed the contract, and we flew out of New York into uh, Frankfurt and then on to Beirut, and uh, we were going to connect through on Kuwait Airways into, into Kuwait City. So we flew in and landed, and if you, I, I was sitting next to the window, I looked around on the airport tarmac, and there were all these large burned out areas on the, uh, on the tarmac, and so I said to the guy next to me, I said, you know, what, what happened here? He said, oh, the uh, Israelis uh, came and burned a lot of planes uh, here on the runway. I said, recently? And he said, <laughs> he said a couple of weeks ago. So Charles and I had to go into the airport to, to have a seat to wait for the flight to Kuwait. We walked in, the entire inside of the reception area was pockmarked with uh, bullet holes. And the, 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 literally the, the uh, masonry was all pockmarked. It was very evident as to what it was. And actually there was a little plaque on the wall. And so we went over and read it. And that had happened a couple of months before. And I looked at Charles and said, what in the hell are we doing over here? You know, this just doesn't make any sense to me. And he laughed, thought it was a, a great adventure. And, uh, and uh, so we spent some time in Kuwait. But the Kuwaitis were an interesting group of people. They're, they were they're top level. A fellow named Abdul Latif al Hamid was uh, uh, trained at, uh, at Harvard, had his MBA from Harvard. He was president of the uh, International Monetary Fund. He was a brilliant and wonderful personality. But below him, there was virtually no bench depth. You had a group of people. Our contemporaries were all, they were flush with the oil money. There was a certain arrogance that was built that came out of that newfound wealth. They um, um, had totally different, these guys were uh, college educated, but they had a totally different reaction. And it took me a while to figure it out. But they, Candidly, didn't grow up the way that the people in this room would have grown up. Their fathers were pearl divers and camel drivers literally a generation ago. They didn't grow up watching their father uh, read uh, the Wall Street Journal or watch Bloomberg and check stocks. You know, they didn't have any of that cultural or educational exposure or background. So they were, they were different. Uh, I would go and try to get budgets approved and they'd say well you know um, Frank we've got Ramadan coming up and we uh, we really can't address that now get back to us in a couple of months well I had marketing campaigns underway with David and other things and hiring people and uh, it was it was very exasperating uh, for me and it kind of ran out of patience and they probably did with me too because I complained a lot about it so that's when I left there and and uh, in 78 and, uh, and did the Wild Dunes bit. But everybody who would come to Charleston to look at Kiowa would end up in my office and Pat McKinney and I were in business together then. And uh, they'd end up in our office and, uh, and say, uh, you know, we think this thing can be bought. What do you think? Um, you, know, you probably know where all the skeletons are buried. And Pat and I would laughingly say, well, we know where they're all buried and we still have the shovels. So we, we, we were involved in it to that degree, but it really hadn't been messed up. Uh, Island's still in great shape. Uh, it hadn't been ruined and uh, it, ought to, it, ought to get, uh, it ought to be purchased. So um, John Rivers, a local businessman who owned Channel 5 at the time and his brother-in-law, Bronson Ingram, and Pat and I put it under contract for $100 million in 1988. And that, did not work out um, for a number of different uh, reasons. Uh, we only had a 90-day option on it, and um, and um, it was announced in the paper that it was not going forward. And I get a call from next day from Charlie Way, and he said, "Frank, uh, see you and Pat are not doing the Kiowa project. Are you interested in doing it with the Beach Company? Are you interested in being our partners and and joining us?" and um, We'd had a very good run at Wild Dunes where they were partners. My brother and Charlie Darby were classmates at Duke. We knew the family well. And I uh, said, uh, absolutely, let's make a run at it. So we put it under contract for $105 million, uh, the second time around. And with the strength of the Beach Company's uh, financial resources behind us, we bought and closed the island. And uh, 
moved ahead with the development. Uh, had a great run from 88 to early 90s, uh, sold a lot of real estate, sold a resort. Uh, you know, it was a great financial success. And uh, so we, you know, had a, had, a, had a great time doing it and, uh, and being back in business with people that we had been with before. We, um, uh, of course, this is the War by the Shore, it's called, which was the uh, Ryder Cup that was held there in 1991. And uh, wonderful exposure for the uh, for the island. Um, it's a really funny short story for about uh, Hugo. We uh, Blanche and I and Sea uh, Pines team, the Kiowa team, were in uh, Birmingham, England, in 1989 when Hugo struck here. We were in Birmingham, going through the whole process for what, how to do the Ryder Cup because we knew we were going to have to do it in '91. It's held every other year. So uh, we were there, Hugo struck, you know, I spent most of the time on the telephone. We checked out of the hotel. My phone bill was more than the hotel bill was. Try, trying to follow track, see what was going on in Charleston. And um, so the story for the next probably six or eight months in Charleston was, did you stay for the storm? Or did you stay for Hugo? Did you ride it out? And, you know, where were you? Did you stay here? And Blanche and I, first couple of times, said, no, actually, we were in Birmingham, England. And the first guy looked at me and said, boy, you really got the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, it wasn't the reason we were over there, and uh, we were sorry to miss that our, some of our family was here, And uh, but it was, a, it was a, a great period of time. Uh, ULI Award for Excellence, large-scale recreation community, was given to Kiowa in 1996, and... Uh, which uh, shortly thereafter, um, we, um, uh, Morgan Stanley had been our real estate investment partner out there. They needed to, uh, had shelf life and a partnership interest. They needed to uh, make a move. And, um, and so they were selling. Uh, Charlie Way and his family decided to, and I decided to sell my interest because I was, uh, um, actually beginning to look at, uh, at Daniel Isle and didn't want the conflict of, uh, of interest. So Pat McKinney and the Darby family stayed in the ownership. Um, Steve's family, uh, Charlie Way and the group, uh, uh, sold our interest, and, uh, and I began the pursuit of, uh, of, of, of Daniel Allen. Wilbur Smith, who had been a partner at, um, at uh, Wild Dunes, was doing the traffic plan and, uh, for Daniel Allen for the Guggenheim family and he called me one day and he said Frank are you thinking about getting involved in in Daniel Island I said well you know I really don't know a lot about it um, but I'll uh, you tell me so well, I'm designing the interchange it's going to happen it's just going to happen you better find a way to get involved so I had several good friends in Charleston uh, uh, Rufus Barkley was, uh, was both a racquetball partner of mine and a business partner we had invested in things together and I used uh, Rufus as a mentor and, and faithful partner, and I asked him about it, and he said, sure. I said, I'll take you to New York to meet the Guggenheim family, Peter Lawson Johnson, who, who is, the, is the primary control of Guggenheim Air. Um, I'll take you to New York, and uh, we'll spend the day in the Guggenheim offices and get to know Peter. And so we did, and long story short, uh, was invited to participate in a, in a competition to do a master plan for Daniel Allen. 17 teams from around the United States uh, competed. Um, I put together a team that included Union Camp Paper Company from Savannah as my financial partner and the planning firm uh, Sasaki Dawson DeMay from Watertown, Massachusetts, who had done Harbor Town. I'd gotten to know the uh, Sasaki people and a marketing expert uh, named uh, Robert Lesser. We um, put it together and made a competition uh, pitch and uh, Got a call one day to come to New York. We'd been shortlisted. The 17-member group had been shortlisted to five groups, and we were in that group and should come to uh, to New York and uh, for an interview. And uh, we did. Thought that it went well. Came back and uh, and um, got a telephone call and said, "Frank, we've got bad news and, and good news. The bad news is uh, um, your team finished second. Um, a group of Olympia in York." It was a big international um, planning and development firm um, based out of uh, Canada. Were successful. The Guggenheim family thought it was going to be more of a 
of a New York base. They thought it was going to be more of a national uh, project than it turned out to be, and they thought they needed a national developer. So they hired O and Y, and but they said, "Then that the good news for you is Olympia, New York, doesn't know where in the hell Charleston is, <laughs> and they need somebody local to, to help them. Would you would you help that family and uh, and uh, would you help Olympia, New York, and be their local real estate?" partner. So I said, I'll take my seat on the bus anywhere I can get it. Thank you very much. And so I joined up. Well, strange things would happen. Uh, Olympia and York vaporized two years later while we were in the process of entitling and doing a master plan. They had a tremendous financial loss with Canary Wharf, which is a big project uh, outside of London. Since been a success, they were ahead of their time. But so they declared bankruptcy, and uh, and we ended up with, uh, I was running the real estate operation and was asked to be the president of the Daniel Allen Development Company by the foundation. Um, the foundation was uh, that owned the property, of course, was an Ilya Mocenary not-for-profit. They were worried about their not-for-profit status being challenged, and um, so we did a joint venture, and I was the outside investor uh, to try to keep that arm's length transaction. And they um, continued to be concerned about it. So they, um, they said, uh, Frank, we really think we ought to, we ought to sell the property and uh, get out of it. We don't, we, the Guggenheim Foundation is too important to the Guggenheim family and we don't want to jeopardize any aspect of it. So I said, well, let me make you a proposal to, to buy Daniel Allen and, um, and I will, uh, you hire an outside consultant, which they did, because I obviously had a conflict of interest internally. And um, they hired Jones Lang, Wooten, LaSalle, um, Chicago and London, and they advised him. Uh, we put together an offer. I had a great young partner, Matt Sloan, who many of you know, who's our president and chief operating officer at, at Daniel Allen. Uh, Matt's 20 years younger than I am and uh, 25 and uh, very smart, hard worker, and uh, had gone to Columbia University with, with young Peter Lawson Johnson, so we had a connection there. So we put together, uh, uh, put together a proposal uh, to the family and, um, and to the foundation and um, began to get to know them, began to sell that, excuse me one second, and began to sell that pitch that we should be the buyers I told them, if, if, you, if you don't accept our offer, I'll sell it for you. So we um, made our proposal and uh, met with the families on several occasions and uh, made the pitch that we had been responsible, Matt and I had been, for doing the master plan, getting it annexed into the city of Charleston. It would be a good thing if, if, if we developed it, and they agreed with that. Sold it to us. That was in 1997. I don't want to overstay my time, and we're getting close. But um, so we uh, got the island uh, underway. We bought it. Um, my brother was uh, our financial partner, and this is an interesting, somewhat personal story, but uh, my brother George was chairman of pediatrics at Eggleston Hospital in Atlanta and uh, married a girl from uh, Salisbury, North Carolina, whose family had... Uh, had developed uh, the Standback headache powder. For those of you who are old enough in the room to remember powders, uh, goodies and Standbacks were the things that people took before uh, capsules and uh, tablets. And they had done very well with it. Well, young Fred Standback went to Columbia to get his MBA. And uh, as a young man, this was in, would have been in the early 60s. And luck of the draw, his uh, roommate turned out to be a scruffy young guy from Omaha, Nebraska named Warren Buffett. <laughs> and um, so it was one of those uh, very unusual, unexpected kind of connections. And Fred Stanback, my brother's brother-in-law, was one of the first uh, investors uh, with Warren Buffett uh, at a couple hundred dollars a share in the early 60s. And uh, con they were best men at each other's weddings. They continued to be good friends. And uh, and, uh, and still are to this day. Fred's uh, 87 or 88, but we didn't use any of the Berkshire Hathaway money to, uh, to uh, buy or develop uh, um, Daniel Island, but we had that credit worthiness and the background that gave us uh, credibility to, to, to get the deal done.
So I told my brother, I'm going to bring in an outside uh, partner. I said, the last thing we want to do is have this uh, real estate development go bad and ruin Christmas dinner for our family for the next several generations. So we're going to do this thing ultra conservatively. We're going to bring in a development partner. I'd known the Trammell Crow family from Dallas, uh, Texas for the years. They actually were developing the Hilton with the Kuwaitis in Atlanta at the same time we were developing uh, Kiowa. So I'd gotten to know Trammell Crow and his wife Margaret. And uh, so we ended up uh, bringing in that group, bringing in the Trammell Crow family as our joint venture partners on the um, on the residential and the golf, we retained the uh, the uh, property. We retained the uh, uh, commercial and office uh, for our own account and have developed it. After 20 years, we are are virtually finished. Uh, we've just put the last piece of property, a uh, commercial piece of property, under contract. We have uh, 13,000 people living out there. Um, started from zero in 1997. We've developed 2 million square feet of uh, office space, uh, uh, most of which we sold in tracks. Of course, as you know, that's where the benefit focus and, and uh, Blackboard's headquarters are. So it has exceeded expectations uh, by all measure. In my opinion, it's uh, a lot, most of it has to do with the fact that we're close to Charleston, South Carolina, which I think is the finest city in the United States. Greatest place to be. If you're going to be in developments like this, it's, it's, it's who you are and what you are, but it's also what you're close to, what the other draws are. And so when people come here to retire or they come here to work, it's Charleston that draws them. And it's, it's been such a, such a key. So anyway, we're, we're almost done out there. Robert did ask me to give you a, students uh, a little uh, uh, just advice from lessons learned. So I'll share three or four bullet points uh, with you that uh, have been uh, important to me. And most of it I learned from, from Charles. I learned a lot of things to do. I learned a couple of things not to do from Charles. And one of those was to borrow a lot of money. And, uh, and because he got caught in the 74 interest rates prime went to 18 you know it was crazy and uh, Charles got caught in the middle of that well we um, we only borrowed enough money to, to buy uh, Daniel Allen we didn't um, want to personally guarantee anything so we told the uh, banks to tell us how much equity we've got to put up so we don't have to personally guarantee uh, we did that we brought in Trammell Crow um, as our joint venture partner they put up the money for the golf courses and the residential. Some of my friends said, well, you know, Frank, that really wasn't very smart. Uh, equity uh, is a lot more expensive than debt. You'd have been a lot smarter just to go and borrow, borrow the money someplace else. And I said, well, I've been doing that all my career and uh, waked up most mornings with a knot in my stomach about how much money I owed and who I was uh, personally guaranteed uh, on notes. And I said, I really didn't want to do that again. So we didn't, and we've approached it very conservatively, and we had an internal practice that every extra dollar that came in, we paid off debt. And that's one of the things I'd like to share with you young people today that is so terribly important. And even just getting started, if it's just your credit card debt or if it's a house mortgage, you know, you get an extra slug of cash for any reason, whether it's inheritance or whether it's a, a commission, uh, pay down debt. Um, I think it's the greatest indicator of success, better than IRR, better than internal rate of return, any of these kind of things. If you don't have a lot of debt, you can weather the worst storms. And when uh, the correction occurred here in 2008, we didn't know anybody anything. And uh, so we hunkered down and wrote it out. And uh, all my good friends in the business, most of them, see Island Company, the Cliffs, uh, Reynolds Plantation, uh, all owed a lot of money, and they all went busted. So I, I give you that caveat as you can. Debt reduction is the uh, is one of the primary things to do. Second would be to uh, be comfortable with who you are, um, understand your strengths and your weaknesses, and uh, 
live with them and uh, make the most of them. My father, who ran a big paper company, told me you don't find any 100 percenters out there to hire. You find as many 85 percenters as you can. You, uh, you shore up their weaknesses and you make the most of their strengths and you build a team. And that's what, uh, that's what um, I've tried to do and it's, what, uh, it's once been successful for us. There, you, you can't be everything to everybody. I'm a generalist. I'm a startup person. I've never had any indication or would I be good at sitting behind a computer terminal working on spreadsheets you know, all day, every day. That's not my interest or my inclination or my aptitude. So I like the bigger picture of planning and team building and um, master planning and marketing and getting things underway. So that's been probably one of my greatest successes. And I, somebody asked me one time, Frank, what is your greatest success? And I said, well, in my opinion, it's picking partners. And uh, my first and most outstanding partner is my wife, Blanche. Uh, have our 57th wedding anniversary in uh, December of this year. We have a wonderful family, um, a number of whom are here tonight, and uh, grandchildren. And uh, I will just uh, give you a quick rundown on them because I'm proud of them, and there's also a Clemson connection. But uh, uh, grandson Hayes is here. He's a rising senior at Alabama. Um, his sister uh, Blanche is a Saturday a week ago cum laude graduate of Alabama. Um, Brumley is a graduate of uh, High Point University in High Point, North Carolina. He uh, is out of school and works here with uh, Palmetto Commercial Properties. Uh, Van Oy Smith uh, is here in the ready mix uh, business with his family, Van Smith Concrete Company. Um, fifth generation of his family with that company and they've been in business here for more than 100 years. So we've got some good deep Charleston roots. But Van Oy's real claim to fame is he's getting married uh, next March, and his uh, bride-to-be is here, Mary Beth Culbertson, who is a Clemson graduate and of MUSC. So we're delighted. If they would stand up, I'd like for you uh, to, to see him. Uh, that's right. So we're very, 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 very proud of The closing remark is to... Uh, is to give back to the community. As, as David said, I've been involved with most of the uh, not-for-profits here in town. I've enjoyed it. It gave me a dimension of, of networking with people that I wouldn't have had any other way. Um, you can start young and start early, whether it's with Junior Achievement or Rotary Club. It doesn't have to be on the big board of the, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, foundation in town. But get started and give back, and it'll pay great dividends for you. Typically, you're thrown in with a group of people, that, like with the Community Foundation, that you wouldn't know otherwise, in different walks of life and different backgrounds. So I would encourage you to, uh, to do that. So I probably told you uh, more than you wanted to hear tonight, but that wraps it up. Robert asked if I would take any questions, and I'd be glad, Robert, if we've got time to do that. I'd be glad to answer any questions if anybody... Has any? And if not, good job, well, we're good. We're good. Well, thanks, thanks very much. I enjoyed being here. Um, and this. Can you talk about your work with uh, Diana Pramar? Yes. Diana, I hope, might be here tonight. Diana uh, is a dear friend from the Sea Pines days. Uh, she's out at Hilton Head. She had a uh, Pramar and Associates uh, uh, for years. She's getting close to retirement if she hadn't uh, totally closed up. She was a speaker here in the speaker series before. Diana is probably knows more about particularly the southeast and the regional marketing than anybody I've ever seen. She knows more about absorption rates and price points and you do a project, first thing you do is get Diana involved and sit down and she will give you a map on exactly how many units you can probably sell annually and at what price. And, uh, and uh, I've watched it come true uh, over the last 45 years here in Charleston with Kiowa and with Wild Dunes and with Daniel Allen. So great lady, great, great friend. Uh, she and her husband, Mark, thank the world of them. Steve Dudash, Clemson graduate here, is, uh, is uh, also uh, a part of our team at, uh, at Daniel Allen, has been from the very beginning uh, and uh, has been a great friend. A lot of good friends in this room, and we appreciate you all being here. Thanks very much. Frank, on behalf of the 
MRED program. This is Real Estate Development Program at Clemson. Thank you for a great evening. Your comments were wonderful. David, your stories as well, so we have a little something for both you gentlemen.